Welcome back everyone, Houston Math Prep here. In this video we'll be talking about finding derivatives and tangent vectors for vector-valued functions. Here we have the limit definition of the derivative of a vector-valued function. Now we won't be using this definition to find derivatives in this video, but we wanted to make sure that you remember the idea from single variable calculus that we used to have a secant line through two points on a function, and when we looked at what happens when we bring those two points closer and closer together, we eventually ended up with a tangent line. A similar idea happens here with vector-valued functions. We look at a vector that points between two places on the vector-valued function, and then we think of bringing those two points closer and closer together until our vector is only touching a single point on the curve, and this vector is pointing straight forward in time in that exact moment on the vector-valued function. When we differentiate a vector-valued function, we simply evaluate the derivative of each component of the vector-valued function independently using the typical rules for differentiation. Since each component, the x, the y, and the z components, are scalar functions inside of this vector function, so long as we remember our derivative rules and formulas, then we'll probably be okay here. We'll also make a brief mention here that there are lots of rules that will look new to you if you're differentiating vector-valued functions, but these really work as you would expect them to if you remember their counterparts from derivatives of scalar functions. These first few here, we have a scalar multiple rule, which looks the same as our constant multiple rule from calculus one. We also have a sum and difference rule that tells us if we have addition or subtraction between multiple vectors we can just differentiate each vector and then do the add or subtract. Also the chain rule will apply if we're substituting some scalar function into a vector-valued function, then we'll get the derivative with that scalar function inside the vector-valued function, but the entire vector will then have scalar multiple of that function that we substitute in. Also pointing out quickly, we have three types of products you'll see with vector-valued functions, and those will obey the same idea of the product rule as we think of it from Calculus 1. Whether we're taking the derivative of a scalar product, a dot product, or a cross product, we can use this idea from single variable calculus that we can differentiate one of the functions, leaving the other as is, and then adding both of those combinations together. Now it's really important when working these product rules with vector-valued functions to be sure you're getting the correct type of object for your answer. Our scalar product and cross product rules will yield a vector answer, but our dot product answer will not be a vector. We should get a scalar function for our solution on this one. We'll just work through a basic example for you here. We're going to calculate the derivative with respect to t of this vector valued function e to the t plus ln t comma sine of t squared. Z component is 3t times cosine of t. So we'll take the derivative of each of these components, and those will be the components of our solution. So x prime of t here, the derivative of e to the t plus ln of t, derivative of e to the t is e to the t, plus the derivative of ln of t is 1 over t. Our y prime of t, so the derivative of our second component here, derivative of sine of t squared, so this will be a chain rule. Outside idea is sine, derivative of sine of something is cosine of something, as long as we take into account the chain rule here. So taking the derivative of the inside function t squared here will give us times 2t. I'm going to move over here and do my z prime of t underneath. Now the derivative of z here, we have 3t times cosine of t. This will be a product rule here, so we'll do the derivative of 3t, which will be 3, leaving the cosine of t alone. And now leaving the 3t alone, so plus 3t, and the derivative of cosine of t will be negative sine of t. Go ahead and clean that up as we write our solution. So if this was r, our solution would be r prime, and our derivative then would be e to the t plus 1 over t, comma, we'll write this as 2t cosine of t squared, comma, and then our last one here, if we clean it up a bit, we'll say 3 cosine of t minus 3 t times sine of t. 
So we mentioned that derivatives of vector valued functions can help us find tangent vectors. When we find r prime of t, that gives us another vector valued function. And that new vector formula tells us the formula for a vector that's tangent to the curve at any t value where it's defined, obviously. So if we want to find a tangent vector at a particular t value on our vector valued function, we do much the same we did with scalar functions in calculus one. We'll simply differentiate and then plug the specific value for t that we're looking at into the derivative to get the vector that's tangent to r at that point. We'll do an example with you here. So we want to find a vector tangent to our vector valued function cosine of t comma sine of t comma cosine squared of t. And we want to find the vector that's tangent at t equals pi over 4. So we'll go ahead and find our derivatives. So our x prime of t derivative of the x component, that's not too bad, right? That's going to be negative sine of t. Our y prime of t, derivative of the second component, derivative of sine of t is just going to be cosine of t. And z prime of t, so if we sort of imagine this written a bit differently, cosine squared of t is like having cosine of t all squared here, right? So this is really a chain rule. We have a power rule on the outside, so our 2 is going to come out front, leave the cosine t alone. The power will go down by 1, so it'll be to the first power. And then we need the derivative of the inside, so multiplying by the derivative of cosine of t, which that derivative is negative sine t. So we'll clean this up, so we'll go ahead and say our r prime of t is going to be the vector function negative sine t cosine of t. And then here we'll say negative 2, uh, let's say sine t cosine t. All right, so there's our r prime, our derivative, but now we want to evaluate the derivative at the particular place t equals pi over 4. So we're going to be finding r prime of pi over 4, in other words, plugging that in for t everywhere. So that will be, of course, negative sine of pi over 4 comma cosine of pi over 4, comma negative 2, and then sine of pi over 4 times cosine of pi over 4. So let's go ahead and say what these are, I think. So sine of pi over 4 and cosine of pi over 4 are both going to be root 2 over 2, right? So here then we'll have negative root 2 over 2, comma, cosine of pi over 4 would be root 2 over 2. And then for this last one, we'll have negative 2 times root 2 over 2 times another root 2 over 2. So you can reduce 2s here if you like. I think we'll do that. And so that's going to end up with negative root 2 over 2, comma, root 2 over 2, and then our last one here, we have negative, and then this would be 2 on the top and 2 on the bottom, so we would really just get negative 1 here. So that is our r prime of pi over 4. In other words, this is the vector that is tangent to this vector valued function at t equals pi over 4. Looking at one more example here, we want to find the instantaneous velocity and speed at t equals 3 of some particle that travels this vector valued function as its position function, 3t squared i hat plus 1 minus 2t j hat minus 4t k hat. And remember, this is just simply the unit vector, standard unit vector notation for the vector valued function 3t squared comma 1 minus 2t comma negative 4t. You prefer it in bracket notation or standard unit notation, you can work it either way. Now instantaneous velocity should be telling you that we should be finding some velocity function, right? And that velocity function, if it's instantaneous velocity and not average velocity, should be our r prime of t, right? The derivative of our position function. So if we find r prime of t, the derivative of 3t squared there is going to be 6t power rule there. Derivative of 1 minus 2t is going to be negative 2, and the derivative of negative 4t will be negative 4. So you can see we get some constant components. We have t in here though. 
So now this is the velocity function in general. If we want the instantaneous velocity at t equals 3, then we'll need to figure out the velocity function, of course, with 3 plugged in for t. And if we do that, we'll simply get 6 times 3 up front, which will be 18, comma, negative 2, comma, negative 4. So that is our instantaneous velocity at t equals 3. We're additionally asked for the speed. So now one thing we haven't mentioned yet is the speed here is going to be calculated as the magnitude of this velocity vector at t equals 3. So our speed is going to equal then the magnitude of our velocity vector at time equal to 3. And remember that's just going to be the square root of all of these components squared and added up. So we'll have the square root of 18 squared plus negative 2 squared plus negative 4 squared. We'll have the square root of all that. Once we do all the arithmetic underneath here, we'll actually get that this is the square root of 344. If you prefer, you could certainly reduce that to 2 times the square root of 86, but our speed is simply going to be the magnitude of our velocity vector. We could also use derivatives to go a step further and find an acceleration vector using a second derivative. This leads us to our next big idea with derivatives, our next video in this series, which is about unit tangent vectors and principal unit normal vectors. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in the next video.